Welcome everyone. First off, I would like to thank you all so much for joining us tonight for the next part of our webinar series on patient cases. Now, before we jump in, just a few housekeeping items first. You are all muted. So we can't hear any uh, verbal comments or questions. If you do have any questions, please type those into the Q&A box on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, you may also need to escape out of full screen mode to see that box. And at the end of the presentation, we will have about 10 minutes to answer questions. If we don't get to them all, we will be replying to those throughout the remainder of the week. And last but not least, the webinar will be recorded. You will be sent a follow-up email with the link, so you can view it at any time or share it with colleagues if you would like. So with that, I would like to go ahead and introduce our presenter tonight, Dr. Kim Cooch. He is the CEO and founder of Oral Biotech, manufacturers of the, the Carry Free CTX system. And Dr. Cooch has been successfully practicing dentistry for over 30 years and still practices three days a week here in Albany, Oregon. And he has an incredible passion for what he does and his vision to create effective Cambro protocols, and that's what continues to drive him in his research to improve Carrie's diagnosis and treatment. So with that, Dr. Cooch, I will let you go ahead and take it from here. Thank you, Kendall, and, and thank you, everybody, for being uh, with us tonight. I'm uh, really excited to be here, and we've got a beautiful day in Albany, Oregon, and I just want to uh, share some cases with you. This is kind of the ongoing part of our uh, series that we started earlier this year. And uh, where I, we started looking at, you know, kind of the usual suspects and then looking at the risk assessment forms and trying to identify, you know, kind of in a simple fashion what was driving the disease for each of these patients we've been examining. And then try and figure out, you know, how do we target therapy for those patients as well. And so I know we've got a lot of um, tonight who, who it's really every month to these webinars, and I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate all of you. Uh, I know that we've got a lot of new people with us tonight as well. So some of this will be, a little of this will be review, but I think a lot of it's going to be um, new material for everybody, so uh, it'll be a fun time. And tonight I want to introduce the concept of wellness coaching. I, as I talked about earlier this year, I'm, I'm in a wellness coaching program, um, and it's been a, a really interesting uh, experience for me and, and the response from patients has just been incredible. So I want to start to share with you kind of the, the wellness coaching concepts and this is something that we're going to continue through this program through the end of the year uh, with the webinars to continue to integrate you know, next step of how we manage these patients because I think really the, the biggest challenge for all of us, the diagnosis is getting easier. Um, identifying the usual suspect, and, and we're you know we're getting better at that. We know what how to target the therapies, and it's really the last piece of this puzzle is uh, the behavioral management for patients and being able to coach them uh, back to wellness and coach them through sustainable behavioral changes. And so there's a lot of uh, different information around that, but I think that you'll find it interesting. So we're going to go go that tonight. I mean, care management has been pretty complex and pretty confusing for most people over the last 12 years, and, and actually, uh, Bob Bowers and I just uh, finished a book that we've written. The title of the book is Balance, and it will be available um, in about a month. We're just going in through the edit phase and, and going into the publisher today. Um, but really, uh, to try and help kind of clear up the landscape, get rid of some of the confusion, you know, try and simplify this. And I, and I realize in writing the book that I've been teaching the scientific why. Why do we do this? Why should we do this for the last 12 years? But I haven't been good enough at teaching the actual mechanics of how we do it. And that's really the, the core of the carry free system. And um, I mean, uh, so often I think it gets so confusing to me, it looks like um, I see programs and I read research and I look at it and I think, I, you know, I can't make heads and tails of it. I can't imagine that a patient is going to be successful with that. And by and large, patients aren't successful when we try and put too much on their plate to do. So, to, you know, we, uh, I wanted to share this with you. We've come redone our website and it's almost all up and running. But one of the things that happened is we designed it so that we can accept testimonials from patients. And I think in the last two weeks, we've We've spontaneously uh, 
received something like 230 testimonials. Uh, and it, I've been reading these, and I tell you, there are days I think I'm banging my head against the wall, and then I read these testimonials, and I think, we're, you know, we're really changing people's lives. And I see that in my own practice, and and it's such an amazing thing that we that we can do for people. But this this person wrote this uh, this testimonial, and the thing yeah. I could just this person. I mean, this is what I've been trying to tell people in the profession for the last 12 years, and this is what Bob Barkley has been trying to tell us, you know, for 50 years and from the grave and beyond, that patients don't really get reinvested in restorative care until they until they get healthy, until they stop getting cavities. And so, you know, our whole focus here is to get people healthy, to get them back to wellness. And the thing that's happened in my practice is that when I've been at over the last 12 years, now these people want, all these patients want the full smile. They want the makeover. They want the veneers. They want the, the bridges and the, and the implants. And suddenly it's like, you know, you get them healthy and, and suddenly they're asking you for all this restorative care. So I know that we're in a, in a time and, and period when it is, um, you know, economically, I mean, it's it's been challenging to say the least for a lot of us. Um, but to have continued to, to do large cases that patients are asking for. I'm doing more large cases in the last four years than I've ever done in my career, and that's because I got the patients healthy first. So I just, that concept is so important, and, and this, I mean, this one testimonial that came in, you know, says, well, now, I mean, obviously, you look at it, and I figured that I have averaged over $4,200 a year in dental costs in the four years before. In the last year, I've only spent $350, and I know that a lot of us would think, oh, well, I was making $16,000 on this patient. I only make 350 and, and what have you, but the reality is that now this patient may spend fifteen, twenty, or twenty-five, or thirty thousand dollars, and you've got predictability in your treatment outcome. You can provide care for somebody with confidence and know at the end of the day, six months from now, a year from now, five years from now, they're not going to come back in with all these cavities in their teeth and with all your restorative care being ruined. So you've been on this topic, uh, you know, all year on the usual suspects, you know, bacteria. They either have too much bacteria, they've got the wrong bacteria. If they've got a dietary issue driving their disease, typically they've got too much sugar in their diet or they're eating too frequently. Uh, if they've got a saliva issue driving the disease, typically that's xerostomia for older patients. It's age-related and also medications-related. But at the end of the day, it always comes down to Kaiser Sose and the pH. And, I mean, this is a pH specific, a pH-mediated disease. So I introduced the concept of wellness coaching to you tonight. It's kind of like the next step. We've got a risk assessment form, and the risk assessment form doesn't tell us that they're high risk or low risk. It tells us why. It answers the question, why does this patient have this disease? And so the real purpose there is to you put that high-risk patient, and you already see the cavities in their teeth. I need a risk risk assessment form to tell me that they're high risk. I need the risk assessment form to tell me what's causing that disease, which of the usual suspects is driving the disease for that person so that I can target my strategy and my therapy specifically to those um, to those so that we can get the patient healthy. Last step then, if it involves behavioral change, and the reality is whatever you do for this patient, if they have to do something different, it requires behavioral change. Even if you're asking them to substitute a 5,000 part per million floral gel versus their normal toothpaste, or you know, if you're asking them to rinse with this instead of what they normally rinse with, or whatever, I mean, even the, the most basic change that you're going to end implement for them still requires behavioral changes on their part. And so that's the hardest part of this puzzle, and that really is, is wellness coaching. It's where I think that we get an opportunity to, to sit with our patients and really figure out how to help them. Now, I've written, uh, I've read, I haven't written books on wellness coaching yet. I'm getting ready to do that. Um, I've read probably half a dozen books in the last two years on coaching and the motivational interview, trying to get my brain around what is this all about and how can we utilize this to help our patients. If you're interested, these are some great books. Um, the National Interviewing in Healthcare is an excellent text. It's got a lot of conversations between, it's primarily directed at physicians and patients, but it, it still applies to us. It's still that being able to sit down with a patient and figure out where that is. In, in the process of wanting to change. Um, a great book that I finished last year is by Michael Arlosky. It's Wellness Coaching for Lasting Lifestyle Change. I would probably recommend this book to start with. Um, it's got some great information on kind of the fundamental um, 
fundamentals of how coaching works, kind of the infrastructure. You're putting those pieces together for you. Um, this is an excellent text. You can get all these off of Amazon. Um, this is a classic textbook on coaching, and this book was originally written by James Flaherty probably 30 years ago, and this is the, the third edition. It was just written or kind of updated in 2010, and it's a really excellent reference. Uh, it's a slow read, but again, it's another book that I would, if you're interested in this topic on coaching, and it's, all, it's about coaching in general. Uh, kind of principles of coaching, not necessarily wellness coaching, but to have to share with you, uh, I met Fusha Knight at the start of this year, contacted her last year, and she is a wellness coach. She is internationally recognized. She has contributed, made great contributions to coaching, and she just happens to live in Portland, Oregon, but I was prepare travel wherever she was at in the United States to go through her program and spend time with her, and, uh, and she's speaking at two dental meetings that I'm um, uh, I've got her set up to speak out in the next year, but I have to tell you, if you're really interested in coaching, uh, John Durango and I are going through her program right now, um, and it's just a, an excellent program, and this lady has such a grasp on coaching, and she developed the whole concept of whole person wellness, and so all the material that you're going to see that I'm using tonight, I actually have got from uh, from Ferocia, and she's just, uh, she's my coach, and she's an incredible person, so um, the Brooke Institute, you can and, you know, look it up, you know, look it up online. And if you're interested in, you know, putting something like that, she puts on workshops periodically throughout the year. Um, wellness coaching, you know, in, in uh, Ferocious model, really we use the acronym FOOT, um, which stands for Focus, Outlook, Opportunities, and uh, kind of a tactical plan or targeted strategies or take action. There's a lot of different things you can use the T for. But um, typically, in um, the they look at focus first, like, you know, ask the patient, what would you like to focus on? Um, it's very interesting because it seems like it's like, well, it's kind of like the chief complaint question. Like, you know, do you have a chief, com what is your chief complaint? Um, or is there something bothering you today? Or is there one thing in particular that concerns you the most? A lot of, way to, a lot of ways to phrase that. And I have to tell you, when you use the word focus, you get a different response from patients. And that's patients, you know, what do you like to focus on? And that tell you know, and, and right away we cut to what is their most, what's bothering them the most, what are they most concerned about, and we look at that. Outlook, another word for outlook is obstacles, but I like outlook. Uh, it's, a, it's a more positive term. But it's like, what are the challenges that you see for the patient uh, standing in the way of them being able to achieve whatever it is that they want to focus on and, and create? And we're going through these tonight with these patients. This is the opportunities. What resources do you have available that are at your disposal, whether it's financial or personal, um, time, you know, what kind of opportunities do you have? What have you done in the past that's worked well for you? What have on in you know kind of on the on the plus of the column here that's going to help us accomplish this? And then the last thing to do is to, is to put together the plan for the patient. And when it comes down to um, the plan, let me go back for a second. When it comes down to the plan, I would really like to ask patients, what do you think we should do? How would you solve this? Because once we identify what the issues are and we know what the patient, we, we help them get focused on what they really want to accomplish, I ask the patient, you know, what do you think we should do? And it's amazing to me that patients know what they want to do, and they pretty much will have a plan, and they're intelligent people. People. And, you know, whether they want to start on tooth number 12 or tooth number 3 or tooth number 8, you know, they used to be invested in, you know, having to be the expert and having to be right and whatever. And allowing them to put this together and lay out their, their plan for themselves, it's uh, it's really been kind of a, taking a lot of that uh, responsibility off my shoulder of having to, having to be right, having to have them do it my way. Uh, I get to, to help them do it their way. And a lot more, a lot more a positive response from people when you do that. One of the most important things to do is ask open-ended questions. And I have to tell you that we in the profession are experts at asking closed-ended questions. We typically ask things that are answered with yes or no. Are you having any discomfort? Are you in pain? You know, do you floss? You know, how many times a day do you floss? You know, it's it's not like, you know, a better question might be to ask like, like you know. Um, are you having any issues with flossing? How is that going for you? We talked about it before. Give me an update on, 
on you know, flossing in your, or just tell me, describe for me what your home care regimen looks like, rather than saying, do you floss? Because, you know, the correct answer to that is yes. And how many times you floss, the correct answer to that is twice a day. And you don't really get anywhere. And, and I've been telling people to floss for 33 years, and it doesn't make them change their behavior. So it's like that waste of time. So ask questions like, what would you like to focus on? You know, and this is a great question. I know I've talked to you all about this before, but getting a patient, basically, we make behavioral changes based on an intellectual thought. We make behavioral changes based on an emotion, on a feeling. And so if you can get that person connected emotionally with how they feel about this, you have a better opportunity to get them connected to make, get them prepared to make the behavioral change. Um, you know, asking a patient how has this affected your life, I typically do not ask these kind of questions uh, in the operatory. You're going to want to ask this if you have a consultation room. You want to be sitting with your patient and you want to have a box of Kleenex on the table because uh, more often than not, there's a tremendous amount of guilt and shame, uh, and emotional baggage attached to dental caries, and uh, typically patients break down when I when I start asking questions like that. And the other thing that I do that that this I've, I've learned this as well is rather than being judgmental and you know being the uh, cross examination when you're you know talking to your patients or asking them questions, it's 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 not use the term. Well, that's that's interesting. Tell me more about that. And tell them I'm curious about that, but it's not judgmental. It's not you know if I ask you what do you eat, you know, what are you snacking on? How many times do you snack during the day? What do you snack on? And I start asking them you know these kind of questions. I'm cross examining them. You know, it's a lot, you get a more truthful response and you're more of a team. If say to your patient when they tell you that they snack a lot during the day, that's interesting. Tell me more about that. That's not judgmental. And so they're, they tend to be a lot more open uh, to you. you know, on the focus, you know, I ask questions, you know, what would success look like to you? You know, I know. You know, what's that going to look like for me? How I know at the end of all this that I've been successful for you? What is your goal? What would success look like? And, you know, what could I do for you that could make our time that we're spending together tonight? Think about this. What could I do and share with you? What would you like to focus on? And what could I share with you tonight that would make this next hour most valuable for you? And another good, great open-ended question is where would you like to start? Um, on the outlook and the obstacles, you know, is there anything that you can think of that can prevent you from accomplishing this. And typically in dentistry, you know, we, we all know the answers to this question, right? You know, the reason you think that you can't do this, well, number one is money, uh, fear. Number this time, answer one is trust or confidence. You know, and I hear this all the time, and I know that you do as well. You know, I can't afford it. I'm worried about how much this is going to cost. Uh, I'm really afraid. Of, of having that procedure done. I'm worried about how it's going to be painful. I'm scared of needles and drills. It's like, man, I have so many things going on on my plate right now that I just don't have the time to get this done. And that last piece is, you know, it seems like every time I do this, it ends up failing and I end up having a tooth extracted. I'm never going to have another root canal. I mean, they just have over a period of time because nobody has addressed what's causing the disease. We've only been treating their signs and symptoms. Um, we haven't gotten back to, to treating the actual cause that you know, they, over a period of time, they lose trust and confidence. Those are the typical obstacles that I see with, with and I know that you see as well with patients. Um, opportunities. You know, what do you, you know what what have you done in the past that works for you? You know, if you to make a behavioral change, what best thing, best way for you and your life to to make that happen? You know, you get all kinds of interesting responses. But you know what works? What works best for you? Uh, let's do it that way. You don't have to do it my way. You tell me because I'm your coach. I'm here helping you. I'm trying to help you the answers that you have within yourself to be able to accomplish this. And that's what a coach's role is. That's so what resources do you have available to you? Is there anything else, you know, anything you can think of? Uh, and we put together a, tra a tactical strategy. You know, what do you need in place to maybe be able to make this happen? You know, how that work best for you? And, and is the time frame realistic? You know, what kind of time frame do you want to set for yourself to do this? Um, that's where we start. Uh, so let's get into a patient in here. And these are, you know, real patients of mine. Um, this 27-year-old female, she's not taking any medications. She's got a broken tooth. Uh, she's got, you know, multiple decay. You can see plaque built up on her teeth. Her blood pressure is normal. Her pulse is normal. Uh, so we look at the radiographs and immediately 
you, you, you identify uh, this person's got some issues, and there's uh, you know some serious decay going on in the lower right quadrant. She's got a serious decay on the on lesions on the lower left quadrant. Um, you know, so here's somebody who's got some issues going on, and we know that the tooth number five is broken. Um, so I'm looking at this going, wow. Okay, so why does so I start to think to myself, why does this person's mouth look like this when a healthy person don't. Like what's happening in that environment to that biofilm that's causing it to be acidic, that's causing this kind of damage to occur? And so you, know, you start asking that, and that's the point of the, the risk assessment form. And so this is a patient that we've actually looked at before. Uh, turns out that she drinks things other than water more than two times during the day, and she snacks frequently between meals. As we go down to the disease indicators, the things that we're looking for, I'm concerned about her, you know, she has visible cavitations, she has new and progressing and proximal radiographic radiolucencies, um, she has new or empty white spot lesions, and her biofilm change happened to be high. So we know that um, she's, yes, 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 I'm concerned about all three of those disease factors, uh, disease indicators, and so um, this is a, a patient falls into extreme risk category number five. So risk factors are a concern. I'm looking at her mouth. I see saliva bubbling in the back. The disindicators are a concern. The active white spot lesions, um, the, you know, decay, um, and the fact that she's high biofilm challenge. So, so I'm looking, I'm thinking usual suspects. She's got saliva, so I'm starting to, to target on diet and bacteria. So diagnosis for this patient, she's a type five, high and extreme high and extreme risk. She drinks a lot of sugar drinks during the day, and she has frequent snacking. So between these two topics, um, between those two things, uh, that's attributing mostly to this disease. She has too much sugar in her diet, and she's also eating too frequently during the day. So primarily for this person, um, this is a dietary issue. We really need to deal with um, focusing on the, those behaviors and being able to make those dietary uh, recommendations and, and kind of coach her through the dietary changes. And that's what's causing the bacteria. You know, she's got an overload of bacteria and she's got the wrong bacteria. Ask her, what would you like to focus on? And it's, you know, her after she stopped crying, um, I want to save my teeth. Stop getting cavities. Um, so I, you know, so let's look at the outlook. Um, you know, the challenges for you. Well, number one is money. Uh, she's a young mother. She's married, but has two small children. Uh, money is going to be a challenge for them uh, in, in terms of being able to afford the dental care. She's really, I think, just lost confidence and trust in the fact everything that she's had done. You can see the root canals that we're extracting, the other root canal tooth that broke. You know, she obviously she didn't follow through on, on you know, making changes and doing some things at the same point in time, she has three new significant lesions because we haven't yet addressed, nobody's ever addressed what's causing her disease. The, on the other side of the line here, in terms of opportunity, she is ready to make changes. She is committed and she feels extremely guilty. She feels guilty that they're taking the finances from the family budget to save her teeth. And she, that's a very, uh, she's got a lot of um, emotion attached to that. So that was a, uh, one of the things that really, you know, made her feel bad as we sat and talked about this. So the technical plan for her is immediate biofilm modulation. She immediately went on uh, carry-free, you know, CT for treatments. Um, we're going to try and, you know, get reduce overall bacterial load. We want to treat her for that. I'm going to extract the teeth that need to come out. I'm going to restore all the rest of her lesions with glass ionomer. Then we're going to stage her treatment over maybe two or three years. Once we have the glass ionomer in place, and then she and I are going to start working on well coaching on the dietary changes. So, you know, you get down to that, and, and the question I, I asked her is, well, what do you think we should do? And she's, you know, so the patients then start to ask you, well, I need my snack is a problem. What does it matter? snack on. It really doesn't. Uh, there are healthier things to snack on, but at the same point in time, if you eat, you drop the pH in your mouth, and that influences this disease. And so rather than tell her, here's what you need to do, you know, how would you solve this? You know yourself, you know your life, you know how you eat, how would you solve this? You know, what would work best for you? And she immediately laid out a plan for, well, if would it be okay if I snacked once in the morning, mid-morning, and maybe once in the afternoon? I'm like, yeah, be 
be great. I mean, that's a huge improvement for you. Let's get started with that. The sugar drinks. Well, if I'm, you know, adding sugar to my coffee and I'm drinking that periodically throughout the day, if I stop just adding sugar to the coffee, if I went to an artificial sweetener, would that be an improvement? Yes. That's a huge step forward. Can you make that change? Is that realistic for you? Are you okay with doing that? And where do you want to start? How do you want to start that process? So that's as a coach. Now I'm talking about you know, nutrition counseling here for her, but I really want her to tell me how she wants to change the behavior. And I don't want to overload her with having to change 16 things at one time. We've already got her needing to use the rinse, so we're uh, we're using the antimicrobial therapy. I've got her to replace her denophorus with a, a 5,000 part per million gel. You know, so we're getting her to kind of do this replacement for things she's already using. And I want to help help her start working on changing her behavior around the sugar in the drinks and the um, and the and the snacking frequently. You know, throughout the day, she was basically eating pretty frequently throughout the day. So, you know, I ask her, where would you start? How would you go about this? I think we should solve this problem. And, you know, people are intelligent. You know, she says, okay, if that's the issue, how about if I do this? That's great. Is the coffee is acidic? Is that still a problem if I drink coffee? Well, water is a better choice. But for now, I mean, rather than trying to get you to change too many things, let's just substitute, um, you know, an artificial sweetener for the sugar, if that's okay with you, or start, learn to start to drink your coffee black. You know, let's just start with some baby steps here. Um, interesting, I was at a meeting at the Cleveland Clinic on Wellness back in June, and they actually see patients in their coaching program, they really believe it takes nine months of consistent um, reinforcement and contact with a coach for a patient to make a long-term lifestyle change. You know, we would always have this idea, I think it's in Japanese behavioral studies, that, you know, a new habit only takes 21 or 28 days to develop, whatever the, whatever the statistic is, but it really... Uh, great lasting lifestyle change may take nine months. And so, you know, we as a profession, as we go through this coaching and I'm integrating this into my practice, need to figure out ways to automate that so that we can continue to touch the patient uh, to re as with reminders, maybe by email or a text message that gets sent out to continue to remind that patient over a span of even the nine months. So asking the patient, you know, where do you want to start? Um, and she basically laid out her plan sat and listened to her, and by the time we were done, she had it all laid out. She had kind of where she wanted to start on changing her behaviors, and, you know, I sent her out of the office, and, and you know, she had a positive, clear path and a tactical plan, and the next time I saw her, the first thing that I did was ask her, it's the accountability piece, I'm your coach, I'm, I'm here to help hold you accountable, um, so how'd that go? How did the changing the, the, taking the sugar out of your coffee, how did that go? How's that working for you? Uh, tell me about that. Give me an update. You know, kind of check in with me. Let me know what's happening. Um, so that's how we, you know, we approach this. From, and then you modify that behavior or maybe make another suggestion. And if you're going to, you know, make a suggestion to a patient, you always want to ask their permission. Would it be okay if I shared with you, I have an idea that other patients have done that's worked really well for them. Is it okay with you if I share that with you? Um, you know, this is really about them and really about them being able to come up with their own answer. And that's the whole goal of coaching. So if you're going to make a uh, recommendation, always ask their permission first. This is a patient that I absolutely, this, this oh gosh, she's just a sweetheart came in to see me. Um, I got to see her just earlier this summer. Um, and I had a multi dentist practice, and um, I, she'd been in the office, you know, on and off over the last two or three years. So I have some radiographic history to share with you tonight. But here's this, you know, really nice, attractive young woman who has a you know, horrible case of dental caries. She's 23 years old. Um, she is pregnant at the moment. She has a two-year-old child as well, a little boy, and she's right now in the second trimester. So, I mean, we're right in prime time here. Um, she's The only medications she's taking are prenatal vitamins. Her blood pressure and pulse are, are normal, and she's just absolutely a sweetheart. And a dentist previously had recommended that she have her teeth extracted and that she have dentures made. And so, you know, this this is patients that we see come to us in crisis. Like, here's a person that's like, if I don't do something different, I'm going to lose my teeth, but I don't know what to do. 
And so, oh, well, that's where we come in. And so you get an opportunity to look at a radiograph from 2009 when she came in in pain, a uh, radiograph from 2010 when she came in in pain, um, you know, for extractions. This is 2011. Um, this is the other side, actually, that, that radiograph, I think, is reversed. Um, so you're actually looking at 30 and 31. So you're looking at the progression of this disease just in a matter of a couple of years in her mouth. And then here's bite wings and some PAs. You get a, a real feel for what's happening in her mouth just in the last year, two years. So she is in crisis. I mean, if we don't do something quickly here, um, I can't save these teeth, right? I mean, we're kind of in the ninth inning right at the moment. And I have a question. There are some I can't save, and I have a question about whether or not I can save you know, three or four or five of the rest of them. So, you know, here's her radiographs from June. I uh, ended up extracting tooth number 12. Um, so you get a sense for, for a lot of decay going on in this person's mouth. Again, so you start to look at, um, let me for just a second. You know, you look in this patient's mouth and you start to ask the questions, you know, the suspects, what do you see when you look here? Um, do you see bacteria? Yes. Uh, they have a dietary issue. I don't know the answer to that question, but but certainly we see you know gingival inflammation. Uh, so home care is an issue. Uh, we've got a high bacterial load. We probably have a, an all load of, of highly cariogenic bacteria as well. Um, saliva, you know, it kind of looks like she's got enough saliva. Um, so I'm not too worried about that. So I'm kind of focusing in on bacteria and diet. Um, so we're risk assessment form. She notices plaque builds up on her teeth. Um, she takes two prenatal vitamins every day. That is not going to contribute to xerostomia. She doesn't feel like she has the dry mouth at any, any time during the day or night. Um, do you drink liquids other than water more than two times a day? Yes, she started drinking lemonade, but she's only done that for just the last few weeks. Normally, she drinks water in between meals, snacks between meals, but not a lot. I mean, she snacks, but not that frequently. So, have no oral appliances, so I'm looking at this going, okay, so probably you drink water, uh, you snack a little bit, you know, in between the day, maybe two or three times during the day, and I'm looking at this going, okay, maybe it's just a home care issue, maybe it's just a bacterial load issue, certainly she has a high biofilm challenge at 89.48, she has all the disease indicators, and now I'm down here, her risk factors concern me, her disease indicators concern me, and her biofilm challenge concerns me again. She ends up being higher extreme risk patient number five. So those concern me, um, and I've watched things just deteriorate over time. You know, you start to look and, and think about erosion, you start to think about meth. I mean, you start to think about, you know, all of those kind of things that come into play here. Not really typical of a meth pattern. Um, and really an erosive type pattern uh, as we look at it. Um, interesting, I'm presenting a, a carries update at the World Congress of Mentally Invasive Dentistry on Thursday of this week at the meeting in Portland. And uh, just reporting one paper that I think is really fascinating. They actually, and I think I think this was in uh, the Journal of Dental Research, I think it just came out, um, but they actually looked at erosion patterns from sugar drinks versus diet drinks versus like coffee, but acidic drinks like coffee or tea. And the erosive pattern, and they've actually photographed and documented like three or four different patients, and it's very interesting. Um, this, this is really the pattern of um, sugar drinks. We looked at, the, you know, compared to the photographs that are in the study. But so the patient that has the U.S. specs, we're thinking diet and bacteria, doses type 5. And so asking questions because I'm scratching my head. And I'm not really coming up with anything that, that really stands out. And ask, you know, specifically about the drinks or review that again. And then it comes up that it's like, well, my teenage years up until actually until two years ago when I got married and my husband got me to stop, I was drinking four to six cans of Mountain Dew, regular Mountain Dew every day. Now, if a patient tells me typically they drink four to six cans, I'm guessing that maybe they drink six to ten cans a day, uh, but she stopped two years ago. So I think what we're looking at here, and I shared this with her, I really think the damage that we're looking at here is you've got an altered biofilm because of the Mountain Dew, uh, the sugar that was in the solution, um, and so you've got the wrong bacteria in your mouth. You've got high bacteria.
through a load of those. And I think we're looking at a damage that was done, you know, years ago, but in the last two years, not making any other changes, uh, you know, and leaving all of those lesions and those bacteria in place, this disease is continuing in your mouth without the Mountain Dew. So, um, you know, one of the things we got going in our favor is she's already stopped the biggest behavioral change that I need her to make. So we go into the wellness coaching then, you know, you know, what would you like to focus on? And immediately she wants to save her teeth and she wants to replace the teeth that are missing. Those are her, her top two items that she wants to focus on. And the next out of her mouth is, I do not want my children to have to experience this. I do not want my children to have this decay. And I'm happy to report that, you know, we're in the second trimester. I'm going to have all of those holes plugged. We're going to be in glass ionomer. Actually, first steps in stainless steel. We're going to have our fingers in the dike before the third trimester starts. And hopefully have her mouth, uh, the biofilm challenge, pretty healthy before her next child is born. I got to examine her two-year-old child uh, last week, and he is free of decay. So we have got you know some really good things going on there. But that's that's her focus. Um, so I'm gonna you know I think it's doable, and I think that's another positive. Um, Coach is to always kind of bring the conversation back to a positive future focus. And like I want to encourage her that you know what your goal here, what you want to focus on, that's absolutely doable. You know, that I don't know I can save all of your teeth, but I know I can save most of them. And so that this is doable, right? If you make the changes and you're willing to follow through and do what needs to be done, I can I absolutely see you being able to do this. I, it's completely doable. I think patients need to hear that because they've lost confidence. They're not sure. They're wondering, maybe I should just have the dentures. I really don't want to do that. But you know what? You save your teeth, and I can. I know how to help you, and it's doable. I've done it for a lot of other patients, and, and it's like I need to know, you know, your goals are, are achievable. You know, outlook. I, you know, what obstacles do we have? Not many. Here's a person who has double coverage insurance: a uh, thousand on her husband's plan and a thousand on her plan. I got three thousand dollars worth of dental insurance to work with per year for the next whenever. So, you know, to have um, all of these holes plugged. You know, with glass ionomer, and we're going to have things. You know, got our fingers in the dike here uh, in this in this trimester. And uh, like I told her, now we've got once we've got that done, and we get to be you know the changes made for you, and we get healthy bacteria growing in your mouth. If this takes three or four or five or six years to accomplish, we've got the time, and we've got you stable so that we can go ahead and do that. So as we've got the opportunities, you know, we've got double government insurance, the patient is highly motivated, and the thing that I really, you know, feel is asset or benefit to us is I think Mountain Dew caused this, and she's already been off of that habit. She's already made that change two years ago. So as we sat down and talked about the tactical plan, you know, immediate biofilm modulation, she started on the CTX-36 kit that day. Uh, we're going to restore all of the lesions during the second trimester, uh, two of those Two of those lesions ended up uh, requiring a first step and stainless steel crowns to, to kind of provisionalize them. Everything else is getting glass ionomer. And then we're going to stage her treatment probably over the next five or six years, I would bet. And in the meantime, we're going to work on the wellness issues with her. But I really think that's going to be a fairly simple task because I think the biggest challenge is um, just the Mountain Dew. Now, obviously, we need to work on home care. Um, she started working on that already, and I've seen some really good progress. But this is, again, you know, I, I think, think when I started practicing Cambrim in, in my own personal practice 12 years ago and started on this, I really figured this was a kind of a, a short-term targeted therapy. I figured I'd have the patient healthy in a month or maybe three months at the most or worst-case scenario, six months. And you know, the farther that I get into this, the more I realize this is not a – uh, there is no silver bullet. This is not a quick fix. You're treating a biofilm disease. You're, you're talking about behavioral changes. And I'm starting to appreciate that this is more, we need to start to think more long term. And I don't want to create the expectation for the patient to, all you have to do is use, use this you know, rinse for a month and you're, you're healed. Um, you know, it's, it, it take longer than that. And particularly when there's behavioral changes as part of the equation, I think we need to get more realistic about the time frame and how long that's going to take us. So what do you think we should do? She laid out the plan for me. She, you know, limit her snacking. Uh, she's working on her home care, and we're targeting getting all of these lesions uh, uh, to provision. You know, in the in the next six weeks, we're going to finish them up. Um, and she's, 
you know, going to follow through on this. So she's being, she's done very good, very well so far. So again, just asking her, you know, where do you think we should start? Uh, how do you want to solve this? What works best for you? And she's really motivated. I have to tell you the the uh, one really strong motivating factor for her, she's a young mother, and she really does not want her children to end up with this disease. And so that's an asset for her because that's a strong motivator, and that's one thing that, you know, I, you know, I can talk to her about. You know, this is so important, and I'm so proud that you are doing such a great job. Um, you're really doing well. Keep keep up the great work. You know, when you check in, you know, I, I want the accountability piece there, but I also want to be able to give her some positive reinforcement and, and reinforce the fact that this is really a positive thing that you're doing for your children as well. Next patient came to see me, I think, in June. 36-year-old male, great guy. Um, in fact, I think I saw him in, in the last week even where we're going through, you know, working on, on reasons on him right at the moment. 36 years old. Hater takes uh, seasonal antihistamines, you know, pretty much daily. You know, so I look in his mouth. I see a little plaque, but, you know, it doesn't look that bad, so I'm not thinking that there's huge plaque. I don't see a lot of gingivitis. You know, I start to think dot here a little bit. Um, you know, I worry about the – it's a seasonal thing, but I worry about the saliva. It looks like he's – the tissue is pretty wet. I don't see a lot of saliva bubbling in the back of the mouth, but um, he's got some saliva. So I'm, you know, starting to target in on this stuff. Uh, okay, 18 needs to come out, as does 16. 15 has got serious lesions, so does 19, so does 2 and 3. You know, so you look at these radiographs and go, oh, boy, something is going on here. And I have to really get to the bottom of this for this patient. And um, and so here's the full map kind of set squeezed in here. Um, we got some issues. And, again, I you know, I ask myself the question, why does this person's mouth look like this when a healthy person don't? And so, you know, we look at his uh, carries risk assessment form, and, you know, do you notice plaque buildup on your teeth? Yes. Uh, do you feel like you dry mouth, you know, anytime during the day or night? Yes. Primarily during the hay fever season, which is on right at the moment here for him. Um, do you drink liquids other than water more than two times a day? Yes. It turns out that he drinks soda two, two, two to four cans daily. Um, and again, I I don't mean to be cynical, but whenever a patient tells me they drink two to four cans, they're pretty pretty much a safe bet probably to multiply that times two. Um, and get into the disease indicators. He's yes all the way down the line. His biofilm challenge was 9706. They're all concerned to me. He comes in at a uh, higher extreme risk number five, and he immediately went into a, a CTX 36 kit. So I wanted to start working on this immediately. So his risk factors are concerned, disease indicators are concerned, high biofilm challenge, uh, that's a concern to me. Usual suspects, in my mind, um, here you get appreciate there is a little more saliva in there. Primarily, I think this is a diet and bacteria issue. Um, diet, you know, having the bacterial issues that he's got. So he's that type 5, you know, high-risk patient. So, you know, I ask him, so what do you want to focus on? Well, have the two teeth extracted that you can't they can't be saved and I want to save the rest of my teeth and I never want to have cavities again that's what I want to focus on is that possible it's like yes that's absolutely possible and achievable like I I know how to help you accomplish that so we look at you know what kind of obstacles we have here what's the outlook for us well we have to make some behavioral changes number one home care is going to be an issue we need to modulate this biofilm and number two we need to make the behavioral change. The biggest challenge for him is the soda, so we need to, and it's regular soda, by the way, so we need to, like, make that behavioral change. So that's an issue. Um, and challenge during hay fever season of him experiencing a little xerostomia. I'm not too concerned about that. I think if we can get soda issued out for him, make that behavioral change, and if we can uh, address um, just the home care and making some changes for him there. Again, I think that's going to be a um, that's going to work out. Opportunities. He's got great dental insurance and he has family financing. It's like his family is going to help him pay for this if he needs any money. Uh, he's also highly motivated. He has two small children as well. He does not want his children to get this disease, um, and he's to give up the soda. I said, you know, he asked me about it. We talked, and I said, so, you know. How do you think we should, you know, how do you think we should solve this? What do you think we should do? And he goes, well, it looks to me like I just need to give up soda. And I'm like, 
in my in my inside voice I'm going yes and in my outside voice you know my outside voice I'm telling him I think that's a that's an excellent solution. You know, how do you plan on doing that? You know, what kind of time frame? What works best for you? Um and he said, Would it be okay if I drank that soda? And I said, Well it's a huge step in the right direction. However, over time it's still acidic and can contribute to this disease. So it's like, like that's a good step. You no know, but over time that you're probably gonna want to change that as well. It's still gonna put you at risk long term. So then the question was, okay, well, what if I switch from soda to diet soda, and I do that for a couple of months, and then I just slowly use out of the diet soda, and I start drinking something else. Okay, that's a great, that's dual. I think you can accomplish that. I'm, I'm here to support you with that. When you start making those substitutions, be very careful about what you substitute the diet soda with. Um, you know, again, you know, I think I, I was patient. That was the Gatorade issue. Um there's so many drinks today going through, you know, you stop at the Quick Mart and walk in and you start reading the labels. Most water has sugar in it today or has some flavor and sugar. I mean, I'll, I'll, if you see any, anything but zero calories on the on the label, you've got sugar in there. And so it's it's really a challenge for people. They, they think they're drinking like vitamin water or healthy water or some kind of great improved water that's really good for them. Um, and it might be because it has these vitamins, or whatever. But if it's got sugar in it, and you're drinking that frequently throughout the day, you're gonna like seriously change the biofilm in your mouth and end up with a case of dental care. So I uh, just wanted him to be aware of the fact. And and some of the diet tea, iced teas are extremely um, acidic, and 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 if they have citric acid in them as, as a flavoring agent, it binds the calcium, and so it really contributes to the erosion and it contributes to the pH issues. So you know we really need to help our patients make good choices on that. But in my world, if we can get him to make the switch from regular soda to dead soda, and then he knows that in a, you know, a couple of months he needs to work off, off of that onto something that um, is less acidic and doesn't have sugar in it uh, or less erosive, um, that's a, he's been right in the right direction. So I don't have to win this today. I just need to help, help him make these behavioral changes over the long term. Um, we talked about that. He's highly motivated to work on this and uh, work on his home care. He, I mean, he asked, "How can I start this today? What can I do today to get rid of these bacteria?" I said, "Have I got a, you know, boy, have I got a deal for you? I happen to have this stuff right here." So he started into a CTX uh, 36 kit. Um, I extracted those two teeth, and we're right in the process of restoring lesions. And I, you know, when I asked him, you know, where do you want to start? And he let us plan for me. I want to extract those two teeth first. I want them out of my mouth. And I want I want you to fix this tooth that's broken over here. And then I'd like to have this tooth over on this other side fixed next. And it's like, you know what? That's a great plan. That's doable. Let's do it that way. Let's do it your way. Um, so he's excited. And we've, we've got a, a great start for him. So it's just a matter, instead of telling people what they need, telling what they have to do, asking them, how would you solve this? What do you think we should do? Um, what you know? What is going to work best for you? And you know, we want to start. And is that timeline reasonable for you? So, and he and I also talked about the fact that he's going to have a risk from seasonal hay fever and the antihistamines. And you know, come next summer, we may need to readdress that. And there's options on it, things that I can make recommendations for him when that when that occurs. Um, this is oh, this is, and that's a wrong photograph. Um, I didn't get it as I went through this. Uh, this is a patient, a uh, 50-year-old, uh, 54-year-old patient that came in to see me just this uh, last month um, and has arthritis, suffering from diabetes, uh, high cholesterol, taking multiple medications, um, and hopefully all my x-rays and everything else are correct here. Um, but pressure is normal. Pulse is a little fast. Uh, picture a uh, 50 for your female patient with arthritis and diabetes and uh, quite a few holes in their teeth. Uh, when you look at uh, the bite wing radiographs, like, like literally this patient's got a lot of crown and bridge um, that's been done. Uh, literally I've got, this is the patient's old x-rays that I got from her previous dentist. Um, from last, This is from last year. So I'm looking at these and, I, and I'm looking at this telling the patient that you literally have decay underneath almost every crown as I'm looking on your x-rays. Like, you have some serious issues going on here. And, you know, here's the full mouth. Um, you look at, you know, what's going on around um, 
I mean, I mean, there's teeth I'm not even sure I can save. So I'm, I'm looking at this person has a serious case of dental caries. Um, if we figure out what's causing this disease, I, you're not going to catch up with it. Like, you start crowning these teeth, you are not going to catch up with this disease in this person's mouth. You could recrown, if you could get this patient to recrown their teeth, one, two, three years from now, they're going to be back and these teeth are going to be looking just like they do today. So you're not going to catch up with this disease for this person. So we look at the risk assessment form, and yes, I drink things other than milk, tea, or water more than two times a day. Uh, I snack more than, you know, one to three times between meals, and I have diabetes, um, and I like I suffer from dry mouth. Like, I notice that my mouth is dry frequently throughout the day, and, you know, I'm drinking a lot of liquid primarily because my mouth feels dry. Now, this was a patient that first said, no, I don't want to be screened. And so this is their first risk assessment form um, and didn't want to be screened. I was interested in talking about it, <laughs> but so I have the, 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 the bacterial you know, biofilm chance assessment. So typically in my practice, when that happens, we pretty well stop. Like we don't go through all this. And most patients don't really want to go any farther than that. Um, now, okay, here we go. Now we've got the right picture for this patient. Um, you know, look in the mouth, number one. The mouth is pretty dry. Uh, tissue is shiny there, not wet, shiny, kind of dry, shiny. Uh, I've, I see a lot of decay. This is pretty consistent with the radiographs that we were looking at. Um, you've got lesions everywhere, white spot lesions. You've got new lesions. Yeah, I mean, you're looking at a person that... Um, if we, something, if we don't figure out quickly what's causing this person's disease, they're not going to have any teeth. And, uh, you know, the question is, you know, diet, saliva, bacteria, you know, I mean, what's going on here for this patient? Because there's quite a few things going on. Um, I would share with you that, uh, you know, the type 5 extreme risk patient, she has dietary control, she's diabetic. Uh, her physician told her to lose 30 pounds and told her to, you know, uh, be very strict on her diet. Um, that didn't seem to make any behavioral change for this patient. You know, telling people what to do um, didn't work. You know, so I said, so how's that working? You know, did you lose the weight that the physician asked you to, to lose? You know, how is that going for you? Tell me about. Tell me more about that. Well, as a matter of fact, no, it's not working very well. I haven't lost any weight. Uh, I know I don't eat right. Uh, I know that I'm snacking. I eat a lot of sugar. You know, I, I eat a lot of sugar through the day, and I know I'm diabetic. Uh, but she's also taking other medications, and she is zero stomach. So we've got a couple of different things going on here. Um, I, I don't know about the bacteria because I wasn't, you know, able at first. You know, when I first saw her, uh, I don't know what her bacterial score looks like. I'm going to guess that it's high. I mean, I'd be shocked if it weren't. But I know that number one, what's driving this is primarily uh, diet. It's an interaction of diet and saliva. She's zero stomach, and she's got you know some bad dietary habits that are that are dealing with this. You know, so one thing to share with you. Um, let me go forward. Let me go back here for a second. One thing I would share with you: a previous dentist um, extracted tooth number 14 and built her a new three-unit bridge. So I sit and think, really? That's needed? I mean, you took her resources, and she needed more than anything else was a new three-unit bridge. And, and I just thought, really? I'm looking at, I had to extract tooth number 22 this month. Um, I'm looking at this mouth going, this whole house is on fire, and we built like a new porch on the side of it. I mean, we got a four-alarm fire going on here. And I look at these decisions, and I go, but I, I, that's how I was trained in dental school, you know, how we were trained, and I'm, this training was wrong. Um, there's a great book out, it's called Bounce. Uh, John Coyce just recommended it this year, and, and the most interesting thing, it's an analogy that I love, but it was a fire captain, and they're in a four-alarm fire inside of, a, of an apartment building, and he is with a squad. He's got three guys in there with him, and they're in the room, and they got flames shooting up. They're on the flames, and they stop, they turn the water off for a second. The flames come right back, and the floor is hot. And he says, "We got to get out of here. We got to get out of here right now." And they abandon the structure. Really, within two minutes' time, the floor collapsed. The entire building came came down. And some of this, they're like asking this captain, "How do you know? 
how did you know to get out of that, that building? How did you know that it was about to collapse? Like, are you, do you have like some sixth sense? What is it about this that told you to get out of the building and abandon it now? And in a split second, he put these different pieces of data together. Number one, he said, we, are, we had our hoses directed at the flames. And when we turned the hose off, the flames came right back, which told me that we were not directing our water at the source of the fire. And I think a three-unit bridge here is directing your, your water at the source of the flames. You know, I mean, we, we drill and fill and drill and fill and drill and fill, and it's not the source. Uh, the cavity is not the source of what's causing this. And we need to figure out what is the source and direct our water at the at the source of the flames. And, he, and then number two, the floor was getting hot, and I realized this, this you know the you know the the fire is underneath us. We can't even get to. We need to get out of here. Cause our you know the water that we're spraying in here is doing no good, and the building is continuing to burn. We need to evacuate now. And so it's kind of maybe I look at this map and think we need to evacuate now here. But the reality is we need to figure out what the source of the flame here is for this patient and putting a three-unit bridge in this patient's mouth um, is, is, is the best use of their resources at this point in time. We, we need to put a, a serious fire out here. Uh, and doing one three-unit bridge and using all of her resources for a year isn't really going to help her. Um, so when I asked her, you know, what, what would you like to do? You know, what would you like to focus on? And she said, well, I really would like to save my teeth if that's possible. She had no idea that she had decay literally throughout her entire mouth. Um, and, said, and is it possible for me to ever become decay free? You know, is it ever, is it really possible for me to stop getting cavities? And, and, and again, it's like yes, that's possible. And I know how that we can accomplish that, and I can help you with that if that's you know what you'd like, like to focus on. You know, obstacles here, the diabetes, you know, the diet issue, and the dry mouth are her big going to be her biggest challenges. And so I can recommend therapies for her. Um, to, you know, tell me what her what her ideas are, but I can also recommend therapies, particularly for xerostomia. We're probably going to need to put this patient in a tray with a neutralizing gel at night. I mean, that's probably a recommendation I'm going to ask her permission to make for her. Opportunity, she has dental insurance, and she is highly motivated. She does not want to lose the rest of her teeth. She'd like to replace the teeth that are missing, uh, and even as you know, ask me about implants. So, but she wants to get healthy first. She wants to save her teeth and stop having cavities. So work for this patient, immediately begin the biofilm modulation. She went on a CTX. Now, this is a patient that, that want to have her biofilm swabbed. Uh, I'm putting her on the CTX36 kit immediately anyway. Um, we're going to then stage, not state the treatment. We're going to stage it. Uh, and then work on helping her get healthy and become decay-free. You know, I'm also able to talk to her about diet. So as we talk about that, um, maybe as a coach I can help her, uh, you know, work through some of those dietary issues as well because that's one going to be one of her risks. You know, so where do you want to start? You know, how, you know, do you think that we should solve this? What works best for you? And, you know, her plan was, well, any tooth that needs extracted, I think you should extract first, um, which I said that's a great plan. I agree with you. And how do we just get this decay out of my mouth? And how do we get the bacteria uh, fixed? And how do we do that? And and it's like, okay, let me, is it okay if I offer some recommendations? And it's like, yes. So here's a person that uh, at the end of all of this, she asked if, if this was realistic. And I said, no, it is realistic. I've patients that have much worse teeth than you've got that we that are been decay-free for five or six years running and should be decay-free for the rest of their life. So this is absolutely achievable. I see you being capable of doing this. It's going to require behavioral change on your part, but it's like, and I, I can help coach you through that. So it's like, this is absolutely doable. And she thanked me when she was done, and she said, you know, I've never really had a dentist that listened to me like this before. And, and she goes, I've never felt like, you know, somebody really knew what was going on and was, had listened to me and understood the problem. And she said, I've never had anybody talk to me like this before. And so she gave me a big hug, and she was really excited. And I'm excited. I, I, we're going to do some wonderful things for her. So, you know, uh, we've, we've used our hour. I hope that you found this valuable. Um, you can learn coaching in an hour. <laughs> and, uh, but I, but I kind of wanted to introduce the topic to you tonight and kind of get you, because we're going to continue on this journey together 
of wellness coaching and, and what are those more of those powerful open ended questions look like and how do we help those patients and how do we actually set up wellness coaching a coaching program in our practices to help patients. You know, how is that possible? Um because that's what I'm working with on my own, on my own practice right at the moment. So, but just, just take some of these questions and start using them. Start asking questions. Start asking open-ended questions, and you know, just like you know, asking the patient, you know, what would you like to focus on? Tell me how this has affected your life. What would success look like to you? You know, how how would I know that you know, I'm successful for you a year from now? If I want to be a successful dentist for you, uh, be your your team member here, be your coach. How, what would that look look like for me? How will I know? How will we measure that? Right? Ask those kind of questions and then you ask them, you know, how would you solve this problem? You know, you said that soda here is creating the biggest risk. It's probably driving this disease for you. You know, how do you solve that? Right? And let them come up with the solution because when a, when a person comes up with their own solution, they're more likely to be successful with it. Telling somebody to brush and floss does not work. So I know that we've got a few questions that have been um, sent in. We've got a few minutes for a couple of questions, and I know that Kendall wants to talk to you as well. So I really just want to thank you for this evening. Our next webinar, I, I believe we're going to have John Featherstone as a guest, uh, but I'm going to continue this series throughout the year, the rest of the year, on looking at patients, how we manage them, how do we stage that treatment as we talk about that and how do we how do we deal with the wellness coaching for them so uh, thank you everybody so much it, it is such an honor for me to be able to spend these these hours with you and and share my experiences and knowledge with you to try and make the benefit uh, to all of your patients that so much better thank you thank you dr cooch and also thank you to everyone for all of your questions we do have a few coming in um i know you all really like to hear about these cases. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. We'll get through as many as we can. Um, just a couple of things before we move into questions, though. Number one, uh, Dr. Cooch, will you just say again what the name of the book was that Dr. Coyce recommended? We had a few people just ah, asking okay. to, the, the, to the title, the title. The title of the book is Bounce. Bounce, like bounce a ball. It's just the title is strictly Bounce. Okay. And, awesome. You know, I've just started reading it, and I couldn't even tell you the author's name. All I can tell you is it's a great read. <laughs> um, well, we can look into that, um, and we can always email people later yep. on yep. after we the webinar. We can get yep. that information for we them. We get that information out to everybody. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I also, just in case, I know we are um, running up to just about 6:30 Pacific time, um, the end of the the webinar here. So if you need to break off, feel free to do that. I will spend the next 10 or 15 minutes or so answering some questions, but don't feel like you have to stay on the phone. Uh, before we move into questions, though, I did want to let you all know about the special that we're running tonight. Um, for those folks who are new to Carry Free, they're really interested in getting started, um, the Level 1 package is what we would recommend. Um, it is intended for those offices that would like to just start small, begin introducing this to a few patients in their practice who they know have the usual suspects and, and would greatly benefit from treatment. Our special on that package for the webinar tonight only is $399. $399, it's normally a $650 package, so it's a pretty awesome deal if you want to take advantage of that. Um, you don't necessarily have to. If you aren't sure where to begin, you just want some more information, you're intrigued by, by what you heard tonight, um, you can also schedule a phone consult just by calling us, or you can go to the, the link at the top of your screen there, which is start.carryfree.com. Uh, if you are a current customer, you are also more than welcome to take advantage of that offer. It is just a product package. Um, again, it would be $399. Um, so you're more than welcome to do that. Give us a call tomorrow. If you have just general questions about your program um, and, and just some you know training questions, you can visit the training.carryfree.com link. Please also feel free to call us, and, and our phone number is listed there. Let's go ahead and get started with some questions. We had some really great ones coming in. Um, I think the first one that I will ask was about a particular case, Dr. Cooch, that you, you went over tonight. Um, it was about case number two, the pregnant mother. Um, and the question, there, it's a two-part question. Number 
question, do you culture mom saliva for strep mutans? And any consideration of using silver nitrate to kill the bacteria in the lesions? Uh, great questions. Um, and let me address both of those. Uh, no, I don't culture mom for uh, mutant streptococci. I used to. Uh, the correlation between the culture kits and the actual uh, kill mutant streptococci, and we did that in university studies, uh, is the collection rate isn't very high. Now, the, if you have a blood auger culture medium uh, and you're doing that in your practice and you want to do that and that works for you, go for it. That that will cor correlate very well. Uh, but most of the other small cultures that we have just aren't um, very predictable. And so what we found was that the ATP using the carry screen swab um, is, high, is the most uh, effective biometric that we've got for this disease. In fact, we just wrapped up a study um, at University of Minnesota in the pediatric department there looking at mothers and, and children, pairs, looking at their ATP, and that's being presented at a couple of meetings. And so I can't tell you what the data was, but I can only tell you that it's being presented at the meetings. And uh, uh, I've seen the data, and, and we're, we are pleased. So that's about it as much as I can tell you, but that you will see that data as it comes out from the primary investigator. So um, we know that, that, that um, AP is certainly for a, a pregnant mother like this is a probably the best biometric that we use. And it, and it only takes 15 seconds and I can use it chair side. Uh, so I hope that answers that first question. The second one is on silver nitrate. And I would do that, um, I use silver nitrate on and off over the last three or four years. And I've had really mixed re results with it. Uh, on children, I've had some pretty good results. On adults, I've not had very good results with it. So, um, and it's not predictable. So, would I use that? You know, if I were in a situation, let's let's put it this way: if I were in a situation where I had a patient like that that wants to save their teeth and couldn't afford to like even allow us to go in and and clean those. Um, out, those lesions out, and put glass ionomery in just to, I, I mean, I'm just trying to get my fingers in the dike here. If they couldn't even afford that, or uh, let me say, typically I use silver nitride on Alzheimer's patients, uh, just trying to delay the, the lesions on their teeth long enough, you know, to kind of um, ease them, you know, save, I guess, without trying to be crude, uh, just trying to ease them through the, the end of life experience without needing a lot of you know, restorative dentistry. So silver nitrate, I think, has a great application there. I think it has a great application um, in children that are that are extremely high risk in certain, you know, um, segments of the population. But uh, for a young mother like this, I, I would use it as a last resort. But my preferable method would be to go after the bacteria, the entire biofilm in her mouth with a strong antimicrobial agent like, you know, the carry-free treatment, uh, treatment rinse, the CTX, for the rinse, and, um, and try and get glass ionomer. Just try and get all those lesions out of there. And rather than put silver nitrate on them, uh, clean and put, and, and put glass ionomer in. So that's kind of how I would approach that. I, I know that I probably didn't answer your question directly, but um, I, I answered it in three different directions. So uh, <laughs> I, hope that's hel I hope that's helpful. Yeah, and um, we actually have a lot of, of great questions coming in. Um, I really think this is a topic that people are interested in, so we might spend just a few more minutes going over some of these questions. Um, another one I think has uh, more directly um, pertaining to implementation um, and exactly how you would approach a specific conversation, a specific patient case, and that is what if a patient has a low biofilm number, but and I'm, I'm kind of inserting some words here, and assuming that you would feel they still need some sort of treatment. How do you convince them that they need to go through the CTX program? You know, that's a really good question as well, Kendall. Um, and that's the whole usual suspect story, and, and it's quite interesting. Um, as I began to identify a lot of these, like I've been showing you these extreme risk cases. Like these are all that very everything and it's typically uh, it may be diet and bacteria and saliva. It may be all of the usual suspects are playing a role. But typically for most of my patients are not type five but are maybe type 
two, three, four, typically when I look at things, it's really like one primary risk factor. It really comes down typically to one thing that's mostly driving their disease, and I just need to correct that. For some people, we've always assumed that if you had cavities, you've got a biofilm issue, you've got a bacterial load issue, you've got you know too many mutant streptococci and lactobacillus. And you know when I was culturing patients and actually checkerboarding them and, and looking at the DNA, I found that that didn't correlate. And like 40% of the children in the United States with severe early childhood cases have zero mutant streptococci. They have zero. And when we look at that, there's something else causing that disease driving it. And so it's interesting to me, and Tanner at the Foresight Institute, where I do my checkerboarding at Harvard, um, and Tanner Group in the last 15 months has identified two brand new bacteria uh, that play a role in, in children's in delicate children, and interestingly, because I've been saying this for the last year or so, I'm finding for patients that it's either primarily a dietary problem, or it's primarily uh, a bacterial issue, or it may be primarily a salivary issue, but it typically I kind of identify as kind of one thing than the other. And Anne's data, she reported in her paper, the conclusion was that the, the children broke into two groups. They either had a bacterial issue or they had a diet issue that was causing their severe early childhood caries. And notice there weren't any children that really had a salivary issue. When you think about it, children you know, are salivary factories, I mean, for the most part, unless they have, uh, you know, unless they have asthma or they're on Ritalin or something like that. So they typically, and in her study she found, but she started to identify the fact that in kids it's really one of two kind of usual suspects. And that's what I'm seeing in adults, but then also throw in that salivary factor. So I've got a patient that has a low biofilm score but has decay, um, you know, and I need to look at, you know, I want to get a, support the biofilm as much as I can. I may not need an antimicrobial agent, but I need to neutralize. And, I, you know, you've got a pH issue. We're sitting with uh, Kaiser Sose here, and we still need to, you know, to neutralize Kaiser Sose. And so... You know, we've got other products. You know, we need to figure out what's driving your disease. But at the same point in time, I need to, to take advantage of remineralization, neutralization, xylitol. I need to, to, to take advantage of those therapies for that patient, even if they have a low uh, bacterial score. And you know, we've cultured, we've compared culture scores and, and also checkerboards to the ATP, and they correlated very well. So I have a lot of confidence in my ATP score that that person does have a high bacterial load. So for me to put them on an antimicrobial agent, per se, probably isn't going to be a real benefit for them. But they still have decay, and I can help support a healthy biofilm, and I can help neutralize things and help remineralization. I've got all those other issues that I want to drive with products designed specifically to help them. So that's typically it's a conversation for me with the patient that, um, yeah, it's not a bacterial load issue, um, so I don't need to put you on an antimicrobial agent. It's like if you didn't have a bacterial infection, it wouldn't do me any good to give you an antibiotic, so we don't need to do that, but you still have a fever, and it might be good to use some other medication that helps bring the fever down. And so I use analogies like that with the patient, just simple ideas that they can go, oh, okay, I get that. You know, so um, that's probably, you know, just, just, just simple, you know, analogies. The patients are smart. They pick that up. It's a great question, by the way. Thank you. And I think I will kind of combine the, the next questions because we've got a, a few that pertain to the same thing. And that is just how to manage in general the situation if the patient says no to the first two questions. So do you feel like you're just picking out your highly motivated patients with the CRA form based on those first three answers to the the form and those questions? Or are you able to kind of move patients to, to be more motivated? So if they do say no, how do you handle that situation? Do you what what questions do you start off with to kind of approach that? So Kendall, you're certainly not giving me any soft balls tonight. <laughs> That's a great question. No, I, I appreciate that. And it's a very difficult question. And it's a difficult question to answer. Uh, and it, and it's, a, it's a long, complicated answer to that question. The bottom line is you can't coach somebody that doesn't want to be coached. I can help somebody become healthy if they're not willing to make the behavioral changes. So if they are completely unmotivated, 
um, that, you know, there's no point going any further in conversation. It's like if they're okay with losing their teeth, they're okay. I'm okay with them losing their teeth. Uh, that doesn't mean I'm only risk assessing people that are motivated, but I. But that those first three questions really for me are trying to identify in that motivational interview uh, segment, is this person motivated? Where are they at on this whole sequence? Because if they answer no, like that lady did, uh, you know, patient number four, you know, I hear somebody came to see me, uh, tooth broke off, they got this decay, they, they recognize they have an issue, but said no, right? Didn't want to go through that process. They actually now have a completed carriage risk assessment form and uh, and a biofilm score on her. But, um, you know, it, it opens the door for me to ask the question. I, it's, I find it interesting that, um, you know, you, you know that you've got a lot of cavities and it seems to be a real problem for you, but you weren't interested in being tested for the disease. Tell me more about that. Right? It opens the door for me to ask the question. It's like, you know, her first response was, well, I just figured, like, what's the point? I'm, I'm about ready to throw in the towel here, and I'm figuring, like, wh whatever. I'm kind of given. She had mentally kind of given up. She had just invested in this brand new bridge, and now she had kind of realized she had a, another tooth broke off, and she was just kind of like ready to give up. And when I actually then sat down and started asking her questions, you know, those powerful open-ended questions, you know, tell me more about that. Um, you know, she opened up and said, well, I just don't see the point. I think I'm going to end up losing all my teeth anyway. And when I said, well, what if that, you know, what if the case, you know, what if it was possible to save all your teeth? What if we could be successful and save the rest of your teeth? You know, how, would that change your um, your thought process? Would that change how you'd answer that? And and so I use that a lot of times to, to, to ask patients, you know. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Tell me. Tell me more about that. Um, but that's a tough, but, but, but that's part of a big picture question of are they motivated? Because if they're not motivated, they're not going to be successful, and you can't make somebody do something that they don't want to do. And if they're not motivated, and if you coach somebody that doesn't want to be coached, I mean that's the bottom line. Now, the one that you'll learn, however, in the coaching experience is that not everybody, nobody, is completely unmotivated. Like maybe unmotivated because they have a lack of trust. This lady didn't think she really could save her teeth. And when she found out that she had other options and maybe that was possible, that improved her motivation. So um, don't just assume that everybody's unmotivated or, or has no motivation. I mean, you're going you're gonna to meet some people like that. But, I mean, even the people that I meet in the worst crisis, um, you know, dealing with two meth addicts right at the moment, and, you know, even though they're in crisis, they still have this motivation. They want to, you know, in, as much as I watch them struggle with their addiction, they want to get healthy. They want to stop the addiction. You know, they it, you would you would may write them off and think they're not motivated because they relapse or whatever. But these people still have motivation, even at the worst points of their of their life. So um, it's it's a big picture question that I can't answer easily. But uh, when somebody says no, that opens the door for me to ask some some inter open and interesting questions to really see where they're at. And I have patients that tell me, no, I'm just not interested. You know what? And you know, that's okay with me. You know, I ask them the question, you know, if, if you're okay with going down a path where ultimately you're just going to lose all your teeth here, if you're okay with that, you know, hey, where we're headed, I'm, I'm your co you know, I'm your partner here. I'm, we'll go there together. I, I make dentures. You know, I make great implants. <laughs> so, you know, but um, – but it kind of helped weed out the people and open the, and it starts the conversation and that's really what it was just designed to do. So right, another great, you guys are asking some great questions. And and we have many more that we probably will not be able to get to, but I just want to say thank you to everyone again. Um, we will be replying to the the rest of the questions throughout the the we via email. Uh, and again, please, if you, you would like more information or if you are ready to go ahead and get started, give us a call. Um, our number is 866-928-4445. Uh, we would be really happy to help. So thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Cooch. Um, this is an exciting webinar, and we hope you all have a, a great night. Well, I hope everybody found it valuable. Thank you so much for spending your time with me. Again, it's really an honor. Um, and I will Lord, to to be with you again next month. So as our webinar series continues, so everybody have a great week. Good night. Okay.